November 24, 1971, a man hijacked Flight 305 on Northwest Orient Airlines. He agrees to let the passengers go in exchange for four parachutes and $200,000 in cash. After the exchange, the man jumps out of the plane with a parachute and the money and is never seen or heard from again. Today, we'll discuss the legend of D.B. Cooper and the details of how he hijacked the plane, the FBI's prime suspect, and how the FBI blundered the investigation. Next, on Technically a Conversation. Greetings, you're listening to Technically a Conversation, a podcast where we share an interesting topic or story with each other and hope you find it interesting as well. I'm one half of your host, Jose, and I'm joined, as always, by my lovely co-host, the vegetarian whose favorite vegetable is shrimp, Isela. How are you doing today? I'm doing pretty well. How are you doing? That's also very true. So I'm glad you called me out on that. (laughs) (laughs) I'm doing good also. Good. The rumors are true. The Mexican pizza will be coming back on May 19th, or I guess it came back on May 19th by the time y'all hear this. I'm so excited. Me too. And Dolly Parton and Doja Cat will be doing a musical (laughs) called Mexican Pizza, the musical on TikTok on May 26th. I know you said you're super excited to see that. I'm here for that too. (laughs) I don't know how much you could really be excited enough to put a musical for a food item. Like, this is very unprecedented. (laughs) (laughs) It is, but you know what? That's what I like about Taco Bell and Dolly Parton. They're not afraid to take risks. Yeah, and her and Doja Cat, like, I I love Doja also. So I'm very curious. I'm probably going to tune in just because I'm curious. Yeah, well, that will be two of us tuning in that day. There you go. And if you haven't heard our episode on Dolly Parton yet, go check it out. That woman is a living saint. She is. She's awesome. So quick reminder about our contest before we get started. If you enjoy our show, take two minutes to leave us a review. What should they do again, Isela? Take a quick moment wherever you're at. Leave us a favorable review. Take a screenshot. Shoot it on over to any of the places listed in our socials on technicallyaconversation.com. It'll give you all the details and can't wait to see all the awesome reviews. And once you do, send us a screenshot to one of our socials. We'll read it on the show. And once you get 25 reviews, we'll do a drawing and give the winner a sexy Technically A Conversation t-shirt. So again, check out our website or just check the show notes for all the deets. To those of you that have already left us a review, thank you. Thank you so much, guys. Quick shout out to the queens, Elena and Erica. We missed you last week, Erica, but it looks like she's back with a vengeance this week and making up for all the lost time. I'm enjoying all the uh, the old videos that she's kind of rediscovering. <laughs> and then, of course, there wouldn't be any shout outs without the Duke, Stephen B, and Cover Your Eyes podcast, as well as Irene A., Thank you for sharing our post on your social media. We do appreciate it. Very much so. With all that business out of the way, ready to get started? I am so ready. (laughs) Great. Let's get started. Okay. So Isela, have you ever been on an airplane before? Yes, definitely. Did you ever hijack any of those airplanes? (laughs) Never crossed my mind. Okay. Well, there go a couple of follow-up questions. (laughs) Oh, I have I have another one. Have you ever been a passenger on a plane that was hijacked? Thank God, no. That's probably one of my nightmares. No. Well, let me tell you a little story about what was probably the coolest plane hijacking in history. Oh, coolest. <laughs> That's okay. It's a good story. Okay. On November 24th, 1971, a man boarded flight 305 on Northwest Orient Airlines in Portland, Oregon. A short time later, he hands a flight attendant a note indicating that he has a bomb in his briefcase, opens up his briefcase to show her, and asks her to sit with him. After a few moments, she takes a note to the captain of the plane. 
The note states that he would let all 36 passengers go in exchange for four parachutes and $200,000 in cash. After the exchange, the man jumps out of the plane with a parachute and the money and is never seen or heard from ever again. On this day, the legend of D.B. Cooper was born and remains the only unsolved hijacking case in commercial aviation history. Very cool. So are you familiar with D.B. Cooper? I am familiar with D.B. Cooper. So for all the listeners that might not be familiar with D.B. Cooper, now that we gave the Cliff Notes version, let's go into all the deets. Now, the majority of this information comes from the HBO Max documentary called The Mystery of D.B. Cooper by John Dower. Link to this and all the sources will be in the show notes. Let's start off by setting the scene. It's pretty rare that you hear of an airplane hijacking nowadays. Security is definitely a lot stricter now than it was in the 60s and 70s. Do you want to take a guess, a gander if you will, at how many American airplanes were hijacked between 1968 and 1972? 68 to 72? I don't know. It's probably something shocking like 20. Oh, it's a lot more shocking than that, girl. Oh, no. According to Vox, there were over 130 American airplanes hijacked in those four years alone. That's a lot. They stated that hijackings in the 60s were as common as mass shootings are today, which is fucked up and super sad that the U.S. has that reputation. Just another mass shooting? America's gonna America. Oh my God, yeah. The HBO documentary mentioned that it was common for Cuban nationals to hijack a plane and request to be taken back to their homeland. One of the pilots who was interviewed, William Radicksack, stated it was actually kind of fun. Everyone on the plane would get a bottle of rum, a couple of cigars, get back on the plane and fly home. What made the D.B. Cooper incident different was that it was a hijacking demanding money. And if anyone was going to know the difference, it would be William Radicksack, as he was the co-pilot the day of the D.B. Cooper hijacking. So let's start out by listing some of the facts and information that we know. On November 24th, 1971, the day before Thanksgiving, a man going by the name of Dan Cooper purchased a one-way ticket for $20 on Northwest Orient Flight 305, which departed Portland, Oregon at 2.50 p.m. on a 37-minute flight to Seattle. Thanks to the U.S. inflation calculator, that would be $141.98 in 2020 money. Mm, how many pesos? I didn't do the pesos, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> I didn't do the pesos for any of the amounts I'm going to give today. Boo. I'm just kidding. Less than 1% of our listeners are from Mexico, so I think it's okay. Our two, uh, our two Mexican <laughs> listeners are sad. <laughs> now, Cooper was a quiet man, appearing to be in his mid-40s, wearing a business suit, black tie, white shirt, and dark sunglasses, and was drinking a bourbon and soda and smoking cigarettes. He seemed like a super chill and suave guy, so I imagine him smoking Benson and Hedges or Paul Mall cigarettes. I really like the vibe that he was giving out. Yeah, okay. Shortly after 3 p.m., he hands the stewardess, Tina McLeod, a note. She thought that Cooper was hitting on her and had given her his phone number, so she put the note in her pocket. The next time McLeod passed by, Cooper told her that she should read the note. According to McLeod, the note said, Miss, I have a bomb here, and I would like you to sit with me. Cooper showed her his briefcase, which had what appeared to be dynamite taped together with electrical tape, a large battery, and a bunch of wires. Cooper wasn't fucking around and told McLeod that he wasn't going to be taken alive. At this point, McLeod pretty much became the liaison between Cooper and the cockpit of the plane. Cooper's demands were $200,000 in $20 bills, two front parachutes, two rear parachutes, and a fuel truck waiting on the ground in Seattle by 5 p.m. According to a Rolling Stone article, after arriving in Seattle, air traffic control kept them circling the airport for close to two hours while government agents scrambled to get all the things Cooper demanded. In today's money, do you want to take a guess how much $200,000 is equivalent to? Well, inflation's pretty bad. I'm going to say half a million. <laughs> it's a little bit higher than that. It's probably about how much it costs to fill up your car with gas 12 times. <laughs> how much is it? $1.4 million. Oh, shit. Okay. <laughs> wow. 
The plane landed in Seattle at 5.45 p.m. and the money and parachutes were brought out. McGlow was allowed to get off the plane and pick them up. Once Cooper had the money, he was okay with the passengers getting off of the plane. Along with the passengers, two of the three flight attendants were also allowed to leave. There were only four people on the plane now. Cooper, McGlow, Radicsack, who was the co-pilot who thought getting hijacked to go to Cuba was fun. Oh my God. <laughs> and Harold Anderson, the second officer of the plane. So Radicsack began to do the math. He said, there are four of us and there are four parachutes. Is he going to have us jump out of the plane with them? Cooper instructed the pilots to fly to Mexico City. A short while after being in the air, Cooper demanded that the airplane be flown at 10,000 feet and for the flaps and gear to be down. At this point, it was obvious to Radicsack and Anderson that he was going to jump. Their biggest concern was how the plane was going to react once Cooper lowered the stairs. Oh, shit. So Cooper sends McClough to the cockpit with Radicsack and Anderson, and Cooper opens the bulkhead door. Cooper is unable to get the stairs down because of all the wind, so he calls the cockpit from the intercom phone to tell them that he can't get the stairs down. Radicsack slows down the plane, and they hear a loud bang from where the stairs flew open and slammed closed. And that was the last time anything was ever known of D.B. Cooper until, you know what? Let's not rush it. <laughs> Let's take a quick break. This is so mean. And when we return, we'll talk about Brian Ingram, the boy who came across some of the D.B. Cooper's ransom money. Okay, sounds good. Hi, this is Dakota, host of ContraZoom Pod, where we go back and forth about film. I am obsessed with movies. I could talk about them all day. And if you're like me, then you'll love my podcast. Every week we take a new topic, whether it's ranking a director's filmography, covering major film festivals, or getting way into Oscar season. While every week is different, we do have some recurring topics, like our Make Remake series looking at an original film and its remake, or our very popular A History Of program, taking an in-depth look, looking at some of the biggest companies involved in film, including Criterion, A24, and Neon. It isn't all super serious topics, though, as we always need to play catch-up with all the hottest Marvel Cinematic Universe news and general pop culture goings-on. There's something for every kind of movie lover, whether you want reviews, interviews, or in-depth conversations. ContraZoom Pod is found on all podcatcher apps, and visit ContraZoomPod.com for even more information. Oh, hey there. I'm Holly. And I'm Sarah. And we're the hosts of Cover Your Eyes Podcast. We revisit the 80s and 90s movies of our childhoods and wonder, why the hell were we allowed to watch this? Is it too late now? Is the damage done? Join us and find out as we laugh our way through the trauma and take a lighthearted look at how these movies shaped our views on society, relationships, and sex. Open your minds and cover your eyes every Tuesday, wherever you listen to podcasts. How was your break, Isela? Did you hijack any airplanes during our break? Uh, no. <laughs> No, nor am I planning to. Hopefully, uh, this could be used as evidence for the FBI later. <laughs> what are your thoughts so far? Are you familiar with everything that I've described so far? I am familiar. I did watch the same, um, the HBO doc, but it was a few years ago and I watched it with my dad. I, I don't remember if I had a couple of questions answered, so I'll I'll wait and save them until the end. Okay. The HBO documentary was my main source, but I also did use other sources to fill in the blanks, such as uh, Vox and um, uh, Rolling Stone and and the actual FBI website. So I did fill in a lot of gaps. Okay. So quick recap, D.B. Cooper jumped out of the plane in November of 1971. That was the last time anything was ever known of him. He pretty much disappeared off of the face of the earth. The next day, there was a manhunt going on in the Woodland, Washington area, as that was where Radek Chak felt a bump where he believed Cooper had jumped out. The manhunt was codenamed Norjack and was the largest manhunt the Portland, Oregon office had ever seen up to that point. It was a who's who of law enforcement combing an area five miles long by one mile wide. The FBI was out there, local police, an Arby battalion, 
Even the fucking Boy Scouts were out there looking for Cooper. <laughs> oh my gosh. <laughs> they were looking for anything they could find. The briefcase, the parachute, the money, any sign that he had been in the area. Nothing was found. And it stayed like this for eight and a half years until February 1980 when a kid named Brian Ingram found three bundles of money on a beach on the Columbia River on the border of Washington and Oregon. So in total, it was about $5,800 worth of cash that was compressed and matted down. The bills themselves were in pretty rough shape, and when they attempted to separate the bills, they were almost disintegrating and falling apart in clumps. They did know the cash belonged to Cooper due to the serial numbers matching the ones that were part of the ransom money. The part that's wild... To quote Yui Sela, <laughs> is that the money was found about 45 miles south of where D.B. Cooper supposedly landed. Geologists were brought in to do a geologic survey, and they dug and redug the area where the money was found, and concluded that there was no way that money had been there for close to nine years. There was a layer of strata in the sand that could date back to 1974. If the money had been there since 1971, the money would be below that strata. Since it was above that, it had to have been there after 1974. Hmm. I mean, I don't know if this is the part where I interject my parts of, I think, <laughs> but it sounds like he might have just, he might have just been trying to throw people off. It's very possible. Although $5,800 is kind of a lot to sacrifice, I feel. I would probably leave a couple hundred behind, you know, just so that they can be found and the serial numbers can be cross-referenced. But 5,800 is a lot. 5,000, but out of what, 200,000? Is that what it was? 200,000 was the total, correct? Yeah. Nah, that's barely over 1%. Nah. Okay. So according to the FBI website, by the five-year anniversary of the hijacking, they had interviewed over 800 suspects and had eliminated all but two dozen from consideration. Ooh, that's a lot. According to Bruce Smith, who is the author of the book, D.B. Cooper and the FBI, the FBI really blundered this one. At first, I thought Bruce Smith was going to be a crackpot because they showed him in the documentary wearing a cloak like he was Harry Potter or some shit. <laughs> he definitely gave off big HP energy. Yeah. <laughs> but he did go on to detail all the things that Cooper left behind. There were the cigarette butts as he was apparently chain smoking on the plane as one does before they hijack it. Right. <laughs> this would have had the most DNA. There was the glass of bourbon and soda he was drinking. That would have had the second most DNA. Then there were the fingerprints and the armrests where he was sitting. The FBI lost all of that evidence. What? The only thing they did have was the black JCPenney tie that Cooper removed before jumping, which they were able to get some DNA from. How is that possible? Okay, damn. Yeah, and I remember they on the documentary, they ended up interviewing the person that was in charge of the FBI. Now, it wasn't the person in charge of the FBI during D.B. Cooper's time. It was a person in charge of the FBI like in 2014. Oh, I see. Yeah, so he had no idea how all this could have gotten lost. And honestly, I don't think he would have been the right person to ask, but maybe they weren't able to get somebody that was in charge during that time to ask what happened to all that evidence. Yeah, that makes sense. Now, I want to talk about this tie for a little bit. When I found out that it was a clip-on, I lost a lot of respect for the coop. Oh my God, really? Here I was thinking he was super smooth, super suave, criminal mastermind, smoking his Benson and Hedges. After I saw the tie, I got used car salesman vibes and thought this fool was probably smoking GPCs or Merits or something whack. Oh my God. He's got bigger fish to fry than worrying about a wins or not. <laughs> Uh, I don't know. No offense to any listeners that smoke GPCs or Merits or wear clip-on ties. <laughs> okay. The HBO documentary focused on four suspects, but the arguments for all but one were really weak and were nothing more than self-confessions made to friends or family members. But there was one suspect that really stood out, and that was Richard Floyd McCoy. This guy had been arrested for being a Cooper copycat as he hijacked the plane five months after the Norjack incident. McCoy pretty much followed every step that Cooper had made with the note to the stewardess, to the briefcase, to demanding the four parachutes, and jumping out of the plane. No! 
The only difference was that McCoy asked for a $500,000 ransom, which would be $3.4 million in 2022 money. Much like Cooper, McCoy would have gotten away with it too had it not been for his mangy friend, Ben Anjouarden, narking him out. To quote you again, Isela, with friends like that, who needs enemies? I know, what a jerk. <laughs> so after his friend narked him out, the FBI went to McCoy's house, started snooping around, and found half a million dollars in his attic. Oh my God, that's, that's a lot of money. Now McCoy is still the FBI's favorite suspect and is the only suspect listed by name on the FBI website. He was also the favorite suspect of Smith, the Harry Potter cosplayer. Yeah, <laughs> yes. When McCoy was arrested, they asked him where he was five months earlier on Thanksgiving. He claimed that he was at home, but receipts and phone records placed him in Las Vegas, Nevada. McCoy was sentenced to 45 years in prison for the 1972 copycat hijacking. McCoy was like, nah, fam, I'm good, and busted out of jail the next day. What? Okay, quick question. How did they find those telephone records if there wasn't like cell phones back in the day to place him in Nevada? I think what they did was they went to the phone company and since he was calling his family to let them know that he was on his way home, they were able to track the calls that he was making to his home to, uh, I believe it was a payphone in Nevada. Mm, I see. I want to say when they were snooping around, he had receipts from that gas station. So they were able to place, you know, kind of collect the dots. Okay, well, he was he was obviously the one that was calling because he has receipts from that gas station. Oh, got it, got it. Okay. So McCoy was apprehended a second time and was put in a higher security prison. McCoy was like, peace out, hosers, and busted out again. <laughs> what the hell? Oh, my God. He was on the run for several months until he was involved in a shooting with the FBI, and sadly, McCoy lost. Oh, wow. You got to know when to hold him and know when to fold him. To quote the immortal Kenny Rogers. <laughs> immortal. Well, <laughs> that might be a little far, but yeah. <laughs> Some of the other suspects featured in the documentary were Dwayne Weber, who his wife, Joe Weber, claims confessed to being D.B. Cooper on his deathbed in 1995. She spent the remaining years of her life trying to prove to herself and whoever will listen to her that Dwayne was D.B. Cooper. The second suspect was Barbara Dayton, who was a transgender woman that her friends thought looked a lot like D.B. Cooper's sketch. Apparently, she confessed to her friends that she was D.B. Cooper and got the gender reassignment surgery after the hijacking. <gasps> oh. The third suspect was L.D. Cooper. L.D.'s niece, Marla Cooper, remembers her uncle, L.D., showing up all bloody the day of Thanksgiving, 1971. <laughs> he got in a car with her father and was never seen again. Marla Cooper recalls a conversation with her father where her dad told her he didn't believe they would ever see L.D. again because he was D.B. Cooper. Wow, that's pretty awesome. That probably sounds the most believable, I think. More than McCoy? Yeah, I think McCoy just sounds like he is a copycat and wanted to do certain things. How he got a shit ton of money, that's a really quick question. But he sounds more driven by ego and like, who's going to talk about that? You know what I mean? If you're going to disappear, you should definitely disappear. And thank your lucky stars that you were never caught. Not like try to do it again. What the hell? <laughs> and then ask for more money. What the hell? What was funny about McCoy, I had come across one of the sources when I was doing my research and they were saying that initially the police ruled him out because he looked too young. But all the videos and all the pictures that I could find of McCoy, uh, apparently I think he was in his 20s. He looked like he was in his 40s. Like he definitely looked much older than than his real age. Oh, interesting. I don't know if it was just because at that time, even like teenagers looked like they were in their 30s. Because <laughs> they got to smoke early. That's what happened. And I think it was just a style back then too, the way that younger people would do their hair and the clothes they wore, they, they dressed up like grownups, I feel. Yeah, yeah. They definitely tried to look like bingo men or something. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <laughs> now, as for the initials DB, no one knows where they came from. The FBI believes it was a myth created by the press. The actual plane ticket itself was purchased under the name Dan Cooper. DB Cooper sounds way cooler though. It does. On July 12th, 2016, 
the FBI decided to redirect resources allocated to the D.B. Cooper case to focus on other investigative priorities. Oh, no. Damn. So the case is pretty much closed unless new evidence comes to light. Yeah. It's like, it just went cold, I guess. I mean, that was like, what, like 52 years ago? So he would be in his 90s now if he was still alive. If he was, yeah. And now with those knees. Yeah. I'm just kidding. <laughs> So I was listening to a podcast, it's called Missing in Alaska, and it's about one of the flights that crashed in Alaska, and it was carrying like a congressman, well, two congressmen, actually. But the pilot um, was talking about how he had this person that always asked to go up, drunk, anything, and he said he could essentially like land from any where any place even drunk and he would go up there even drunk and land and the fbi did investigate that pilot and you know he that pilot swore that that was db cooper because he never saw him again after that oh wow which i thought was kind of interesting i was like oh i was just listening to this podcast yeah definitely a lot of legend has come out of db cooper and um i know in the area he was almost seen a little bit as a folk hero because what had happened was that the largest employer in the area, which was Boeing, ended up closing their factory um, in the town where where this hijacking happened. So a lot of people were like, yeah, the little guy's fighting back. So a lot of people were happy to see that he had actually succeeded and he was never caught and you know, he actually got away with it, taking into consideration that he didn't die because it's very possible when those stairs slammed, he was knocked unconscious and he ended up falling in water somewhere and his body was never recovered. I wonder if he um, if he even did all the calculations with all the extra weight on him with the extra cash and all that stuff. I don't know. Or maybe that's why he needed all the extra parachutes. I don't even know. That's wild. Yeah, that was also really strange that he ordered four parachutes. I guess that's why I was thinking maybe because of the extra weight. Yeah, it's possible. And the weather was really awful from what I hear. It was raining. It was really windy. So, yeah, it wasn't the best conditions at all to be parachuting in and then holding money. And then if, if he was wearing dress shoes and he was in a suit and everything, I mean, he really wasn't dressed for parachuting. If it truly was that guy that the pilot person was talking about on that Missing in Alaska podcast, he sounded like one crazy fucker. <laughs> like, he just sounded like... I don't I don't know if he was high and he's like I could do everything or anything or both. I mean, I guess to quote Rick James, cocaine's a hell of a drug, I would imagine. <laughs> you know? Yeah, definitely. And on that high note, literally. <laughs> we hope that you enjoyed the show and you join us again next week. If you're enjoying the show, leave us a review, tell a friend, and subscribe. Wherever fine podcasts are sold. Follow us on the socials at GreetingsTAC. Email us at GreetingsTAC at gmail.com. Or leave us a voicemail at 915-317-6669. If you have a story to share with us. And that's a wrap.